Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode on Talk Architecture. And today's episode is a two-parter. I will talk about first the universal design and accessibility, which is a rehearsal for a company that I will be presenting soon. And then I will discuss um, on universal design principles in the second part. So bear in mind that I am timing this and I hope that you will enjoy this session. I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Naziati Muhammad Yaqob. Um, I'm a founder and the CEO of Zasve Universal Design, uh, or ZUD, or ZUD, with a team of access auditors, designers, and architects. I'm also the director of Zyron Engineering Services in Dremberhard. And together with ZUD, we offer the following services for professionals, businesses, corporations, and property developers on training programs and courses, and some are, could be done online, um, or face-to-face, -face, accessibility audits, universal design review, or appraisals. We focus on system thinking rather than just design thinking. We're looking at a whole system and on solutions to problems in accessibility and universal design. We're focusing on the public, institutional, and residential buildings for the aging population. We have worked with a number of corporations and government agencies, and one of them is SunTrack Development Syndrome Berhad, which is a developer that is forward thinking on multi-generational housing. And we also work with the Kuala Lumpur City Hall and other local authorities and other architects as well to appraise their design. When we focus on a corporation and what they stand for and what their visions and goals are, we know that it's important that we align our discussion, our conversation, so that we can fulfill the need for the corporation's vision. And one of the things is that for MRCB, with core values on accountability, on customer-centric, courageous, creative, and driven, they have decided to set the standard and setting the standard or benchmarking their works with the best is one of the prerogative for the corporation. So we're looking into this discussion to focus on that. I've mentioned about accessibility and universal design issues and challenges. And what is that for a corporation such as MRCB? <coughs> Excuse me. When we talk about construction and property development, we're talking about the new buildings which need to have compliance from the get-go. And we also talk about adaptive reusing of existing buildings and how we could make them up to the standard. When we talk about building types in this particular session, we're focusing on residential, commercial, transportation hubs and sports and recreation. I'll go into that. We also look and introduce the accessibility audits that a lot of companies, because of the standards to be achieved um, with regards to accessibility and universal design to show that they are competing on the equality and diversity inclusion agenda, we will look are looking into accessibility audits, for, especially for the internal and external spaces and specific rooms of the property. And we also could look into heritage building, which has to deal with similar issues. Now, looking at the definitions of accessibility and universal design, accessibility is the practice of making information, activities, and or environments sensible, meaningful, and usable for as many people as possible. This is very, very important that we understand that the environment or things that we do, an event, we're invited to a, a, an exhibition or we're invited to a concert or in uh, some sort of event or speaking engagement. And we would like to be able to understand what is being conveyed. And it makes sense. And there is a sense of 
feeling at home and feeling that we're welcome to be to be in these places. So accessibility is that, something that is active in getting us to participate. And there are a lot of, the, the downside of non-accessibility is that you feel excluded. And that is what we don't want to happen in this day and age. Now we talk about also universal design. And in the United Nations Convention on the uh, Rights of Persons with Disabilities, Article 2 says, universal design means the design of products environments, programs, and services to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible without the need for adaptation or specialized design. So we was saying that from the word, from the get-go, from the very beginning, from the conceptual stages, we have already considered universal design in our design agenda or intention. And we're not um, excluding assistive devices of, of, for particular groups of persons with disabilities where this is needed. Because even though when you think about universal design as something which is to do with a built form, the assistive device is something that should not be taken out, uh, should not be taken like an additional thing. It's part of universal design. So um, what is this universal design for is designing for all. And then we're right in the middle of the majority of the population, we have able-bodied people, and then we have the minority able-bodied people around, which is a non-standard body types, and people with temporary restrictions. And it's quite common that you see people have injuries and they're temporarily disabled for a time, and they have difficulties and challenges, and also pregnant women. Then we're looking at people in the periphery of universal design and the more minority uh, within the population, which is the elderly people, older persons, and disabled persons. And also in terms of communication, people from other countries that do not understand our language. Now, standards is out there. Standards are available in Malaysia, and we have our own codes of practice of accessibility and universal design for disabled person 2014, which is under the Uniform Building Bylaw, and I will go into that later. Then we have the Singapore Code on Accessibility. We have um, the American ADA, uh, American Disability um, Act, Standards for Accessible Design. We have the British Approved Document M and other documents that we could refer to, which are basically under some legislation, is part of a building regulation, or it is standards that is to be achieved by the industry, usually namely the architecture, engineering, and construction in the industry. And we also have codes of practice. We call them codes of practice and the Malaysian standard is one. And there's also guidelines that could be done by agencies to make understanding of accessible accessible uh, design or accessibility needs even much more clearer. Now, when we talk about um, Malaysian Standard 1184 that I mentioned just now, the compliance was the basic, uh, the basics that we need to know. And often when we think about this, uh, we are looking at the critical dimensions that are available in the Malaysian Standard Code of Practice. So this will be discussed in a bit. And what, why is the Malaysian um, 1184 important? Because it is stated in the Uniform Building Bylaw 34A under the Streets Drainage and Building Act that you need to allow people, disabled persons able to enter, use a building, and exit a building. And exiting a building also mean being able to have a, uh, be able to be safe and getting out safe in case there is an emergency. So have we actually achieved compliance in Malaysia and how do we need to actually understand what it is to achieve compliance and also what it is to go beyond that? So this is what the gist of the discussion for today is about. We talk about critical dimensions and anthropometrics and ergonomics that we learn in school. And here we just touching on a bit of the Building Construction Authority of Singapore's Code of Practice. 
on housing and also the Malaysian standard to actually understand the critical dimensions and further understand the reason to them for learning the anthropomic anthro metrical and ergonomic aspects of wheelchair users and ambulant person. We start with the wheelchair user and ambulant persons. When we look at the this diagram, for example, the width of a person included in the wheel uh, using a wheelchair, we don't only take the dimensions of a wheelchair, we have to include the person, which means that the hands are sticking out, the arms are sticking out, sorry, and then they are using the wheelchair. And that is the overall width of it. And the length of it is from the back of the wheel to the front. You may have this foot sticking out and that includes the foot sticking out. So when we look at this typical dimensions as well, we're looking at the heights as well uh, in terms of where the foot is, where the armrest is, where the handle is, and also the height, the typical height of people seated in a wheelchair. Overall, the length is usually 1.2 meters long, and the height is about 1.1 to 1.3. And that's why you can't have switches higher than about 1.4. Even 1.5 is too high. So you need to have something that is reachable. When we think about the width of a person in the wheelchair, it can be minimized to 680, but we have done studies before that it can even go to 750. So that's why we have a 900 millimeter door width in all circumstances. It used to be there is the door width of 850 acceptable, but more and more people are using motorized wheelchair. So when we talk about the BCA standards, um, for example, this is also in uh, similar to all the other standards um, with regard to this basic landing, if you want a wheelchair to be uh, a person in a wheelchair to actually use a space, this is a static 900 millimeters by 1200 millimeters. That is the minimum clear floor space. Again, I mentioned to you the reachability of how one could reach switches, shelves and um, windows and mirrors and, and, and the levels with regard to the height of the counter and table um, at about 675 millimeters is the armrest level, but you need to have the table a bit slightly higher, maybe 700 or 720 millimeters, for example. So then you can actually put your knee or the space underneath and do the work. So this is about anthropometrics and ergonomics. Now we're going to go to another section. We're going to introduce to uh, not only compliance, because when we look at the basic dimensions, this helps us to understand about the wheelchair user and the ambulant person using crutches are also physically disabled people. But when you look at universal design and beyond, we need to look to all users. Of course, a seamless solution would be the idea or the ideal situation when it comes to wheelchair users, rather than ramps uh, or change of levels, which is even more difficult. So when you have a, a design that is seamless and you can just move about freely without, without much effort to be used, then you could focus on these important points here that I wish MRCB and other corporations to understand that you'd go for a seamless solution first, before you go to one that has many change of levels. And then you'd go for also sensory solution. This is beyond uh, mobility impaired persons. We're talking about deaf persons. We're talking about blind persons, where uh, even cognitive uh, disabilities, where sensory, sensory or sensitive to the needs of the sensory needs will be the best solutions involved. And designs, which is, coming from the same, coming from the beginning, which is conceptual design um, stage, when you considered universal design principles in the very beginning, which will help to save about uh, a lot of money and you would only add to 1% of the overall cost. If you're looking into an accessible design, which is adaptive, that costs a bit more. So you would like to consider um, a much more wiser way approach to include from the very beginning. 
Now, who are these people we're designing for? In Malaysia, for example, we're looking at the target users of 36% of the population in 2040, 20% of the population, almost 20% are elderly persons and 16% will be disabled persons. So that makes 36% 36 of the population, which is more than one third of the population. So specialized design, like universal design, need to have a change of mindset to change from thinking about it as special to universal design or just basic good design and common sense of getting more of the population to be involved because there is the concept of aging which affects a family. Now, when we talk about a family, everybody going out to a restaurant in, say, a shop house where there are steps and you can't include grandparents or you can't include the parents or somebody in a wheelchair or somebody who has mobility problems. So we need to start thinking about aging in place and how aging and within the disabled persons communities, we need to consider their body function and structures, their abilities, what activities they would like to do and the participation with everyday life together with the rest of the family, which could consist of younger children and pregnant women as well. So there is this, the issue is to actually look at our environment and together with our personal needs and what are the factors are affecting us and how we could actually move about uh, together as a family and be together doing stuff together rather than being separated or left behind. So when we talk about aging in place, it's very important to consider uh, when we approach residential design, especially of this diagram, which illustrates about what actually happens to a human being as they grow uh, through the years. When you have an active adult living, you're very much independent. You could do anything. You could clean your own clothes. You can do your own washing. You could climb stairs easily. You could do all sorts of things very well, including motor, psychomotor functions and also um, the ability to move about freely. But then also there's some issues of uh, being imposed, being challenged, and therefore you need to have independent living. So you get got about trying to, if you're a disabled person, when the environment, the environment is accessible, safe, and usable, you could have independent living because the environment has been taken care of to assist you. But then there are certain things where the environment cannot actually assist, um, support you, and then you will need assistance from, from a carer or maybe somebody to do your washing, somebody to clean your house. That could be assisted living. Now, assisted living could be in different degrees. It could be quite serious, which you need a lot of help. And then... Obviously, when you can't do the five basic activity daily, daily living skills, which is cleaning after yourself, uh, wearing clothes by yourself, going to the toilet by yourself, and a lot of other th basic things by yourself, you would need long-term care or nursing home. What we're going to focus on is independent living and assisted living to be the norm in terms of when we approach residential design. Now, when we talk about issues of residential design, it's totally different than uh, commercial buildings, transportation buildings, all the other buildings, because we are living in the house and housing complexes. We wake up in the morning, we start from the bedroom to the bathroom and vice versa. So when you look at somebody who is disabled, the need is to actually, um, you can just do things yourself from the bedroom to the bathroom. If not, you'll be assisted by someone. But that is about dignity, where you can actually help yourself to live your life. And you could actually go from the bedroom after you've done your bathroom activities to the living room to cook a meal, to, uh, sorry, to, to the living room to, to participate in life uh, with other people, to the kitchen to cook a meal, to the main entrance to get your grab food, to the garden so that you can do your gardening, to the community facilities in the condominium complex so that you can actually interact with other people and as the main entrance to the whole complex, which you can 
um, uh, or the main entrance to your landed property. And then you could also access the car parking area and you could ex exit the uh, complex. So this diagram is something that shows that exact thing where home modifications to age in place, we need assistance to modify our homes so that it be made safe, usable and accessible so that active aging and in bed and living to ha can happen. So there are all these considerations, like I said earlier, with regard to seamless solutions, with regard to sensory solutions, and uh, the idea of a design that is conceptually thought about the person aging in place from the very beginning. Often the client builders do not know the right way to design. So we, you know, we need to go and do renovation and this costs money. And um, where does this um, uh, budget, where is this funds going to come from as we age? So uh, there are some ideas from overseas, in particular, Housing Development Board in Singapore, they created this 36 square meters flat where they call it the granny flat. And they consider wheelchair users to be able to use a sink here where the portable um, uh, storage area underneath this, uh, the sink can be uh, relocated and you can access the sink and, and you know, have space to do activities freely like wheeling around and there's enough space and on and then we can also look at the idea of two bed two room flexi which is actually one bedroom but you can open the um shall we say the folding door or the sliding door uh, and make the um bedroom bigger if you want to put a hospital bed or you want a carer to take take care of you, you can shift things around the stuff or the furniture, and then you can have a bigger living room from a two room flexi to become a one huge room in this granny flat example. In this granny flat example, 36 square meters, we also consider a little tiny ramp between the grill and the door at the entrance at one is to eight so that you can just easily use access into the housing unit. And usually buyers would want to have a difference of level between the outside and inside. So, but it's not too high that we need to have a longer ramp. So this 25 millimeter height is ideal height. And we can also have other things like vertical grab bars at the entrance so that we can take off our shoes and hold on to something while we do that or have benches. And here are ideas of um, having folding doors, rather than you swing the door to the corridor, you could have folding doors and still be able to negotiate the inside of the bathroom for a uh, elderly person to use the shower, uh, strategically placed to have the a floor trap right under the shower so that less of the water ponding will reach the other side so it'll be less slippery and the use of grab rails and also that next to the um, WC as well. It's a little tiny bathroom, but it, it is quite accessible in a way that it accommodates to a lot of people. In Singapore, we also find this, um, shall we say, transit-oriented development happening already in a lot of places. In Novena Square, we have a lot of hospitals. And this recently, um, Universal Design Excellence Award winner, the Tan Tok Seng um, Hospital Integrated Care Hub, or TTSH-ICH. It is something that has won the award because of the key features such as multiple entry point accessible route, seamless connectivity, inclusive facilities and enhanced facilities are evident in this um, design. So it has considered a lot of thing, uh, a lot of things, including uh, transportation um, nodes or areas where people can actually orientate, wayfind themselves with the directory, uh, which are tactile for those who are uh, unable to see, but they can read braille and, and touch uh, the information on the left there next to the bench. 
And the benches have these handrails that can easily help people with weak knees and uh, lower, uh, weaker lower limbs to actually get up and transition. And also, you know, bus stops have this gentle ramp for people to access the middle door so that they could get into the bus. And there are other facilities here like gym for uh, elderly people and disabled people and also uh, ramps for rehabilitation. So Singapore also has a, uh, another award uh, winner, which is Wan Pungo, um, the developer of the People's Association. And in particular, this has a key feature, which is in the uh, library that is in existence in the housing area. And the library has an overarching theme of inclusivity. The library has a curated person with disability collection. A bookshelves are specially designed. A checkout pod allowing direct passing of wheelchair users, enabling easy borrowing of library materials. The first story of the building is designed for infants and children. And the family lounge allows parents to prepare food for the babies. And the calm rooms are also located to provide a therapeutic environment for children with such space, who need such spaces. So this was applauded and given an award. And the social interaction and um, the, the happening meeting area with a lot of space for movement and activity sets it apart from other housing um, design, which has a library or community space at the heart of it. So that's conceptual design there as well. So in one Pungo, we have the Tempinas uh, hub, which is um, um, uh, where the elderly people could also do activities um, uh, among themselves. Now, this is a question that we keep asking each other, what is beyond compliance? So that will be in my next session. Thank you very much for listening to the podcast. We shall resume soon to the second part.